morning, everyone. We're on day 20 today of lockdown. Can you believe it? 20 days that we've been under house arrest and I'm sure you're tired of being trapped in your home. You're tired of hearing about COVID-19 and all the tips that you have to try and stay sane um, where you are in your space, whatever that looks like. Um, it had me thinking a little bit about what it must feel like to be in prison. And it gave me greater understanding as to why the Bible said, remember those that are in prison. And I was reflecting on, imagine if this was a really long-term thing, if it was a couple of years that you were locked up and how would you try and stay sane? But then I was encouraged again when I remembered the Apostle Paul. And Paul, of course, we know had several stints in prison. Um, and actually, we did some of his best work when he was in prison. Now, Paul probably had a little bit less distractions than what we do. He, he had a few less streaming options and probably the Wi-Fi wasn't as good where he was. Um, but he produced some fantastic work in his time in prison, and especially his time in house arrest, much like we are today. Um, of course, during those times in lockup, um, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philippians. He writes Philemon. And then he writes the book of Second Timothy, which is the one that we want to look at today and that I want to read from. And I find Second Timothy particularly encouraging and significant because, because Paul is writing from prison. But it's also because he knows that he's coming to the end of his life. Paul is aware that he's heading towards martyrdom. This is some of his last communications that he's giving out. And so it's particularly significant. And towards the end of the letter, we'll, we'll read a bit of this. But he reflects on his life that's gone by. And he says, I've run the race well, and I finished well. And part of that now is he's talking to Timothy. He's providing Timothy with some encouragement and he's giving Timothy some instruction so that Timothy would be able to say the same thing. In other words, Paul is saying, I've done well. I finished well. If you do these things, you will finish well as well. And I don't know about you, but I want to finish well. Not just lockdown we're talking about, but we're talking about life. So Timothy isn't locked down, but Paul is. And he says, these are your tips on how to finish well. They're not lockdown tips. I'm sure you've already received uh, 20 different messages and 20 of the same message on how to stay sane in lockdown. This is not that. This is Paul talking about. This is how to finish well. These are life tips, not lockdown tips. And so let's read it together. These are ways oh, and look for principles and ways that we can live to finish well. And so I'm gonna read from the book of 2 Timothy from chapter three, verse 10, all the way to chapter 4, verse 8. Um, now, if you're using a hard copy NIV Bible, you'll see that this actually forms one idea. Um, sometimes with the chapter break, you, you lose the, the fact that this is a single idea, um, which you see in a hard copy Bible, but not so much when you read it electronically. Um, and so that's why we read the whole portion of Scripture together. So 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of evangelist. 
discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So these are really some closing thoughts from Paul. If you want to live and finish well in the faith as I have done, do this. And so we want to look at some of these ideas that Paul presents and see if there are principles that we can apply to take to our lives and make our own. In other words, if we want to finish well one day, this is what we should do, principles we should adopt. You see, Paul was writing to Timothy, but really the idea was that Timothy would read this letter to the church, and so it has application for us today. And so let's look at the first paragraph and the ideas that Paul presents. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, persecutions and suffering, and what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. And as I was reading this, the first thought that came to me was, I wonder what kind of persecutions Paul endured, because he doesn't tell us over here. Obviously, Timothy knew. We'll come to that in a second. But in reading the Bible across different translations, it's interesting. Paul says, you know about my teaching. And when we read that at first glance, we think no is just referring to knowledge. But some of, the, some of the different translations will say, you have followed my teaching. And this is the knowing that Paul's talking about. It's not just about grasping knowledge. It's about putting it in practice. Think about when Jesus was walking around on the earth. He was giving teaching. There was people that followed him. There were people that heard the words he had to say. They knew what he was teaching. They knew who he was. They could see him. And yet they were lost, but they were not following him. And so the knowledge that Paul is talking about is really about a following of the teaching that he gave to Timothy. And then he talks about the persecutions that he, that he faced. We know from reading the book of Acts about what he's talking about. In, in Iconium, they tried to stone Paul. And then in Lystra, they actually did. They stoned him and they took his body outside the city and they threw him outside the city and left him there for dead. And Paul, we know, got up and walked straight back into the city. And so Paul is facing some very serious um, persecution for the gospel. Now, I've heard many, many people say, or I've heard people that have been taught that when you become a believer, everything should go well with you. It's now health, wealth, and happiness. Because I follow Christ, everything is perfect. Everything is fine. I shouldn't face difficulties. And when they do face difficulties, as inevitably we do, they begin to wonder, is there something wrong with my faith? Have I done something wrong? Is God punishing me? But Paul points out here, and it's very clear, that when you are a believer, if you want to live a godly life, you will face persecution. This is echoed in other letters by James and Peter as well. And so I want to encourage you that when you know <laughs> that persecution is going to come, don't use that as a mark to determine whether you've been a good Christian or not. But Paul talks about some things that can carry you through those persecutions, which we'll see uh, in the letter as well. But he comes to the end of this point of persecution. I'm suffering much persecution. And then he contrasts that by saying that evildoers will carry on deceiving and being deceived. And now you think to yourself, what does persecution and evildoers have to do with each other? It can seem kind of random if we don't have context, but what do evildoers have to do with, with suffering? Well, just before writing this, remember Paul says, uh, he starts off with however, meaning he's contrasting a previous thought in the earlier part of the chapter. He talks about the last days. Um, and we know from the context in which Paul uses this in his other letters as well, that the last days is referring to all the days that have come since the outpouring of the Spirit, which we know of in Acts chapter 2. But all these days after the outpouring of the Spirit, that there are going to be evil people around, and there are going to be false teachers, and there are going to be false prophets. He talks about these, uh, these men, these false teachers, being people who are constantly learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. He talks about the way they deceive people and worm their way into houses. And so we're talking about uh, educated people who are willingly misleading people astray. 
And so Paul warns Timothy about these people. And then he talks about the marks in his life. He said, you know me. In other words, you know me, Paul. You know my teaching. And so it's important that we recognize that Paul says it's important <laughs> to know the teacher and know the teaching. He says, you know me because you've seen the fruit, you've seen the love, you've seen the endurance, you've seen the faith, you've seen me face persecution, and you know the teaching that I've given. And I can't stress this enough. Paul is saying, and this is echoed in other parts of scripture as well, if you want to know if the teaching is good, look at the fruit that it produces. See, I can't know always if what this person is teaching is true or not. Sometimes there isn't scripture to, to back it up but I can look at the fruit that it brings. Is it bringing me closer to Christ? Is it producing love? Is it producing peace? Is it producing patience? We know of these fruit from Galatians 5 verse, 20, verse 22. And so one of the markers for identifying whether a teacher is good or false teacher is by looking at the fruit that is displayed in their lives. And so Paul warns about these false teachers and he says, these evildoers will continue deceiving and being deceived themselves. Let's carry on in verse 14. He says, but as for you, instead of being evil, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it. And from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says, remember what you have learned and those who taught it to you. Why does Paul stress this point? Because you can see how the teaching has played out in their lives. Again, you can see the fruit of the teaching. He reminds Timothy that studying the scriptures make you wise for salvation. They're pointing you to Christ. All of scripture is pointing us towards Christ. It's really the focal point of history. And We'll speak about this a bit more as we get to Easter. And obviously once a year, we take that time to remember the importance of the coming of Christ, of his death and of his resurrection. And scripture is pointing to us, it's pointing us to this. And as we study the scriptures, we become more convinced of it. We become more aware of the central point of history. Christ is death and resurrection. So we should know it, we should study it, and we should apply it. This week, my boys were on a call with a family member and they um, had been building some, some Lego and uh, they were building with Avengers Lego. And so they were telling stories about the Lego and how it fits together and um, started to talk about the Avengers a bit. And then they were talking to this family member who has not watched many of the movies and does not know much about what's happening in the whole Marvel universe. And so my boys begin to ask questions and you could see uh, that the person in question didn't quite know how to answer them. At some points they said, well, you know, I don't really know. Um, but then they could start making things up and saying, well, it might be like this or like this. It could be that Spider-Man and Batman teamed up to fight against Yoda. And of course now all people who are true Marvel lovers and Star Wars lovers and DC lovers are all hanging their heads in disgust as they talk nonsense. But then the boys can come to me and I, I love Marvel movies. It's one of my vices. And I can talk to them for ages about it. They can ask me questions because I'm ready all the time to provide an answer. Why is that? I've watched them. I've engaged with them. I know them. And the same then is true of us for Scripture. See, Paul is, uh, is telling Timothy to study them, to be wise, to be ready. How can you answer someone about Marvel movies if you haven't watched the Marvel movies? And in the same way, how can Timothy teach Scripture if he hasn't first studied it? How can I come and rebuke and correct if I haven't heard the word, if I haven't seen it contrasted to my life and been convicted and been changed? The application of scripture helps us to live out the life we've been invited into. And so by engaging in it, I'm trained to do so. So Paul says this, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 
In other words, know what you're talking about and be willing to share it. Preach the word. Be ready always to preach the word. And you may say, well, I'm, I'm not a preacher. I don't have a pulpit. I don't have a place where I'm standing up. But we all preach something through the way that we live, the things that we say and the things that we don't say. And so how can I be ready to preach, to share the good news well, if I don't know it well, and if I'm not well prepared? That's the implication of this instruction, to have studied and applied the word. And then Paul tells Timothy and us why. He says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Why do we need to study? Well, we need to be prepared. People will reject the truth and choose to follow the things that suit them. I will take this bit of, bit of truth, I will adopt it, and I will get rid of this bit of truth. And I will be able to find somebody that can tell me that um, and, and suit what I want. You can find pretty much anything you want on the internet. If you want a conspiracy theory, I guarantee you there's someone that has one. If you want controversy, I can guarantee you there's somebody that is teaching it. If you want to hear that following God will make you rich and take care of all your problems, you will find somebody who's teaching and probably using scripture, although not well, to do it. And many people will say, God said this and can lead you astray. And so Timothy is instructed to know the scriptures well. Because the question is, what does the Bible say? This is the first measure of what God says. I'm always very hesitant to, to um, engage with some teachings that are sent on social media because I don't know the teacher. I can't see their lives. I can't measure the fruit. I don't know their motives. I don't know their heart. Don't gather teachers for yourselves telling you what you want to hear. Remember, Paul says, know the teacher, know the teaching. What does the Bible actually say? That's the first point of call. This this warning reflects something of, of Bible reading habits. See, I can sometimes just read a verse, take something for myself. But the, the discipline of Bible study is actually reading the Bible to find out what the author, who is God inspiring someone, what is the author saying and what were the readers understanding by what the author says? Not looking for verses to back up what I already have decided is true. It's important that we learn to do this well. Bible study is not the same as just Bible reading. We need to read our Bibles, but we also need to study our Bibles. And this is a discipline that actually takes time and work. But if you want to finish well, if you don't want to be deceived, if you want to endure hardships, you need to study the word. Let's see Paul's closing comments. He says, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. His Timothy might be in full-time ministry, but finishing well is not just limited to those in ministry. It's to all believers. Paul says the crown of righteousness is stored up for all of those who have longed to see his reappearing. Talking about the second coming of Christ. Some translations say those who have loved his appearing, those who cannot wait for Christ to come back. Who wants to see the master come back? Is it the one who's done his will or the one who hasn't? I want to be the one that has done what he's asked me. To longingly wait for his coming. And so there's some eternal truths that we can take from this passage. It's written to Timothy at a specific point in time. But there's things that we can apply for our lives today. And so I want to suggest some of these truths for us to apply. And the first one that stands out to me is that believers will face difficulties. And that's not a sign of having done right or wrong. It's not a mark for where your faith is. We will face difficulties. 
The next truth that comes out of the text to me is to stay strong and finish well, I need to develop a discipline of studying the word. It's good for me to have my time of Bible reading, but I need to actively engage and study the word. The next truth that comes out of the passage is that knowledge alone is not enough. I need to follow the teaching. I need to apply the teaching. There are those who study and never come to a knowledge of the truth, which means not putting it in practice. So I don't want to study to learn. I want to study to live it out. It's not just about filling my head. It's about applying the scripture to my life. And then a mark for, for testing teaching. Know who you're learning from. The validity of the message is measured through the fruit of the teaching, which is evidenced in the life of the teacher. So I've said a lot about studying the Bible, and you might be thinking, well, <laughs> I don't really know how or where to start or, to make, or how to make sense of it all. As it takes time, it takes energy, it takes practice. So I recommend starting with the basics and growing into study. We've been talking about some spiritual disciplines, and the past two weeks we spoke about the discipline of prayer. The only way you pray is to set aside time to do it. And I'm really grateful for how we're doing this together as a community on Thursday evenings, praying together and also praying on our own. And so we work time in our schedule to pray. It's a discipline. Now we want to work time in our schedule to study. I recommend starting with the very basics. When you take your Bible, start with prayer and ask the Spirit to lead you into truth. He's the original author. He's the, he's the one who knows it best. And ask him to help you make sense of it. Take your Bible, have a notebook. The Hatfield Training Center says apply three steps. The first step is to look. Read the text. Don't just read the verse in isolation. Read it in the context of its chapter, its larger idea, the book that it's in. See how it can fit together. And read it more than once. Often through reading and rereading, different things stand out to us. And we're looking for things that stand out. We're looking for repetition or things that are confusing, ideas or questions that come up and making note of that. It's causing us to look at the text a little bit deeper, to ask questions. The next step is what they call listen. Listen is what did the original hearers hear, the original readers see. And you might not have tools to be able to do this. You might not have commentaries and, um, and other Bible study tools. Um, and that's the case. I recommend just going onto a site like bibleproject.com. That's some free resources that gives you a little bit of context. It's not majorly in depth, but it will really enrich your time of study. I recommend going through this series on how to understand the Bible. It helps give you some context um, that will help give some more um, value to your Bible study. And then the last step to take is the live step. Okay, so how do I put this into practice in my life today? Now, this is a very, very simple process. And in fact, Bible study is a lot more in depth. And what we'd like to do is, uh, in two weeks' time, that's Thursday, the 16th of April, during the time that we, we have set aside on a Thursday evening, I'd like to go through a bit of um, principles and teaching there on how to understand the Bible. And so if you would like to go a little bit more in depth with that, I, I encourage you to join us with that on Zoom and we'll send out the details for that. But the idea here is that Paul says, if you want to finish well, do these things. And there's a strong emphasis on studying the Bible, an emphasis on, on knowing the word, being able to share the word and not being led astray because you know the word. And so I want to finish well, and I'm sure you do too, which means that a, a discipline of study needs to be put in place in our lives. So would you let me pray for you? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is eternal and that it is true, that it applies to us today. And so as we set in place a discipline of study, as we search your word, we pray that you would speak to us. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us into all truth, that you would help us find what you have said and what it means and how it applies to us today. I also pray that you would give us wisdom 
for the teachings that we do listen to, for the ideas that come and compete with your truth, that we would be wise and we would be discerning and we would be able to measure these things against your word so that we would not be deceived and led astray. I thank you that all things will pass away, but that your word will never pass away. And that this can be the foundation on which we stand. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that all of scripture is pointing to you. And I thank you that we can be in relationship with you. And so as we walk together and learn together, we pray for your leading. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've mentioned on, on Thursday evenings, we do have the time set aside to pray together. Um, there are other connection groups. Please check the email that goes out with our announcements. And if you're not receiving that, please let me know um, by email, emailing icgrenoble at gmail.com. Next week is Easter Sunday, and we'd like to take some time to take communion together. And this is the early warning, so you have opportunity to go to the store and to buy whatever you would need for that. Um, I suggest having some bread or some crackers um, and some juice or wine, as you prefer, um, that we can just have it ready, prepared by the time we start the service. Because what we'd like to do is have the service and then afterwards in, in the coffee chat in the Zoom call to take the communion together. And so I encourage you to join us on that. We'll come into small groups, we'll take communion together, and we'll celebrate together. Of course, we have the Coffee Connect now. If you do have a cup of coffee uh, ready, you can run quickly, make it, and then join us in the Zoom call afterwards. We look forward to catching up. We'll see you next week. Bye.